o'clock. Hmm. A very good morning to one and all. A warm welcome to the expert speakers. Honorable Vice Chancellor of Andhra University, patrons of today's program, Professor K. Samka Madam, Rector of Andhra University, Professor Peri Srinivas Ravgaru, Principal, AU College of Engineering, Professor V. Krishna Mohan Garu, Registrar of Andhra University, Chairman of today's program, Professor Pulipati King Garu, Head of the Department of Chemical Engineering, Co-Chairman Dr. Srinivas Kumar Garu from IICHEWRC, Co-Convener Dr. V. Meena, Organizing Secretary Dr. M. Tuparambal, Joint Organizing Secretary Sri P. Venkatrao, my colleagues and my dear participants. As a convener of the webinar, I take this privilege to welcome you all to the international webinar on recycling solid waste management organized by the Department of Chemical Engineering in collaboration with IICHEWRC. Now, I request Professor Tripati Kingaru, Chairman of today's program, to give welcome address. Chief Patron, Patroners of the webinar, Co-Chairman of the webinar, Dr. Srinivas Kumar, Outstanding Scientist and Technology Director, NSTL, and also Chairman of Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers, Walter Regional Center, Experts of the webinar, Dr. Prakash, Akasham Tatakshu, Dr. Vinu Garu, Dr. Talada Baskar Garu, Convener of the webinar, Professor V. Sri Devi, Co Convener, Professor V. Meena, Organizing Secretary, Dr. M. Tukaram Bai, and Joint Army Secretary, Sri P. Venkatrao, 
faculty of the department of chemical engineering participants this is scholars and students very good morning to all of you on behalf of department of chemical engineering i welcome you all to this one day international webinar on recycling solid waste management organized by department of chemical engineering in association with indian institute of chemical engineers walter regional center as a hod of department of chemical engineering it is my present duty to say few words about the department of chemical engineering this department has passed legacy and it was started in the year 1933 offering a course bsc honors in chemical technology sugar technology and pharmaceutical technology as electives Professor D. G. Walwalker was the founder head of the department, and after that, B. Tech Chemical Engineering was started in place of B. Sc Honors in Chemical Technology in the year 1957. This was the second oldest department in India, and the first department in AP and Telangana. This department was recognized by the Institution of Chemical Engineers, United Kingdom, as one among twenty departments in India and the only department in AP and Telangana. This department has Center of Excellence and the Tech Keep Phase Two. Right now, the department is offering two UG programs, namely B Tech Chemical Engineering and B Tech Biotechnology, and five UG programs, namely. M Tech Chemical Engineering, M Tech Biotechnology, M Tech Mineral Process Engineering, M Tech Industrial Pollution Control Engineering, and then M Tech CSE. All the courses were accredited by NBA. We also offer PhD program as full time and part time, apart from post doctoral program. Coming to the webinar, I congratulate. the organizers particularly convener and co convener for rightly choosing this topic in the appropriate context because nowadays all of us know that solid waste management has become a prominent issue in the world governments are spending so much amount on this particular uh, management and the organizers are rightly choosing this topic in the appropriate time regarding this webinar we have invited and requested four experts from different sectors one is from usa dr prakasham tata garu who is well known expert in the world i know him for the past few years he was a good researcher in this particular field he has done lot of contribution to society in during his lecture we will be knowing about all these things and also dr nageshwar apila from iit gauhati Dr. R. Vinu from IIT Madras and Dr. Talana Baskar from CSIR Indian Institute of Petroleum, Dehradun. In the morning session, Professor and Dr. Pakasham Tata Garu will be delivering the keynote lecture on Professor G. J. V. Jagannath Raju endowment lecture. After that, we'll be having a lecture of Dr. Nageshwar Rao Pilaga. After lunch break and after session, we will be having Dr. Mark Vinu as first lecture, and afterwards, Dr. Talal Bhaskar Gar will be delivering his lecture. I hope this webinar will be a fruitful and successful one. I request all the participants to actively participate in deliberation sessions, and I am sure that this webinar will create a platform for all of us to share our expertise and thoughts to continue our research. further in this particular solid waste management finally namaskara i wish that this webinar a grand success and i thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to participate in this thank you one and all please accept our sincere appreciation sir in this warm morning Your words have filled us with enough zeal for the. Yes, Sri Nivas Kumar. Ah, Sita Vachini. Now I request Dr. Sri Nivas Kumar Garu, co-chairman of today's function, 
to leave your message. Good morning to one and all. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, chief patron and uh, co patrons, chairman and uh, head of the department of chemical engineering, uh, department of Andhra University, Professor uh, P. King, convener, Professor Sri Devi, co convener, Professor Veena, and other organizing members, and uh, the invited speakers i warmly welcome all for this uh, webinar one day webinar on uh, recycling solid waste uh, management uh, which has been very aptly chosen for uh, today's uh, discussion this waste management uh, uh, has become a very very prominent topic for many researchers in the recent days because modern life is overwhelmed with the development of various materials for different applications and materials and materials all around. And uh, waste management or recycling uh, has become even more prominent in the recent past, maybe in one or two months, ever since we came to know that uh, the medals in uh, the recent Olympics have been made out of the recycled materials. This has become a very, very fancy uh, topic uh, since then. And the many premium institutes have already start uh, uh, engaged themselves in these uh, recycling activities. So earlier, the waste used to be predominantly paper, metal, glass, rubber, etc., which was a uh, single component by uh, each of uh, these elements. And uh, the recycling or recovery or waste management has been uh, pretty simple those days. As the technology progressed. Uh, Things have become more and more composite in nature. Uh, materials have become alloys and alloys have become composites. And uh, recycling these multi-layered materials and composites uh, is pretty complicated. And ever since uh, the technology has progressed and uh, we have gone towards the electronic age, computers, cell phones, and many uh, electronic gadgets have become uh, the call of the day. Recycling these electronic gadgets is another uh, uh, major topic for researchers because uh, it uh, encompasses several materials and several valuable materials. Uh, sometimes I wonder when uh, we try to extract one material out of the waste, maybe it is costly, precious. In the process of extracting that noble material or costly material, we may be ending up with uh, generating more and more waste. And now from electronics, we are uh, coming to the age where e-mobility is uh, of more, more prominence through fuel cells or use of batteries. That is again to curb pollution and uh, avoiding wastage in uh, generating the fossil fuels and hydrocarbons. Well to wheel, if we call it refining of uh, petroleum products or the crude petroleum, is a very, very pollutant uh, rich activity. And even the batteries, even the batteries are known for their pollution. If you take lead acid batteries, for instance, they are not just the pollutants, but lead is a hazardous material also. So when we deal with uh, these hazardous materials, the process of recycling becomes even more complicated because human beings are involved in the recycling process. In fact, uh, in many industries, they follow the practice of giving nutritious food when somebody is indulging himself in uh, activities pertaining to lead acid or lead uh, materials. So as of now, worldwide, about 85% of the components in lead acid batteries are being recycled. And about 50% to 60% of uh, nickel and cadmium in nickel cadmium batteries are being recycled. Cadmium being another potent uh, hazard uh, material. It needs to be preserved and uh, utilized in the best possible way. Now, uh, lithium and batteries have uh, taken over and they are replacing slowly the lead acid. And we have established. 
uh, a, a foolproof methods of fabrication of lead acid batteries and nickel batteries. And the technology in Nokia is the lithium ion batteries. And now we are looking for the recycling practices also from lead acid, nickel, cadmium to lithium ion. And uh, recycling of lead acid and nickel cadmium batteries has been a very simple and straightforward uh, method because the components are more or less fixed. Whereas in lithium ion batteries, the components keep varying from lithium iron phosphate, lithium cobalt oxide, to lithium manganate to lithium nickel manganate. So each of this cathode material will call for a new method for recycling. And lithium being a very scarce uh, and scarce item, only three countries in the world are dominating. And beyond that, three countries, we do not have uh, material. So we in India, having no reserve for lithium iron ore, lithium iron uh, ore as such, we may ultimately forever depend on Chinese or Taiwanese or sources, Bolivia. Atlanta, etc. So it is necessary that we develop the processes for recovering these lithium-based cathode materials. And at NSTL India, we are engaged in uh, developing and establishing methods for uh, 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 the extraction of lithium, cobalt, and of course manganese. And we, on the office, uh, we are to welcome any institute or any industry to join hands with us in establishing the procedure for recovery of these materials so that the waste is managed more effectively and uh, it can be industrialized and it becomes an essential feature of e-mobility. Uh, this is about the uh, e, uh, uh, waste management or uh, the material management which is uh, to be neutralized and not to be uh, let to the atmosphere so that uh, the pollutants are minimized. In fact, uh, the worldwide the efforts have been to reduce two degrees uh, of uh, temperature to be reduced in the next uh, 20 years or so. That is possible only when we replace the existing uh, uh, petroleum products usage for uh, the mobility by about 30%. That means 30% of the mobility should be based on e-mobility. Uh, then only we will be able to control the temperature uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, this being the state of affairs, so far as uh, uh, waste management and uh, recycling is concerned. I'm very happy that uh, uh, this noble topic for today through this webinar is being organized in association with the uh, Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers and the local uh, uh, chapter of uh, the IICHE is a very uh, active uh, body uh, thanks to uh, guiding factors from uh, the engineering department of andre university but since uh, its inception in as late as 1959 uh, i suppose the indian institute of chemical engineering local chapter is one of the oldest it has uh, engaged itself in many many activities like conduct of seminars annual conventions and also silver jubilee activities and we have uh, oh, and enrolled many student chapters to this uh, IACHE Walter Region Center. We have got uh, one mm -hmm. wing mm -hmm. in Gayatri Vidya Parishad and Anit Sanil Nirkonda Institute of Technology and also in uh, GMR IT Shrikapulam. And these, uh, in fact, I had an opportunity of participating in one of the institute's uh, uh, inaugural uh, uh, student chapter uh, activities. And I was overwhelmed by the participation of the students. They are so enthusiastic to participate in any of these uh, seminars or any such technical activity associating in the Institute of Chemical Engineers. And with these few words, I wish uh, the organizers all the very best for a successful uh, conduct of this webinar on uh, recycling solid waste. And I compliment for having chosen this particular topic, which is of uh, great relevance for today's uh, Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you and best wishes. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, sir, on behalf of the whole team for the beneficial speech we received. Now it's time for convener report. Myself, Dr. B. Sridevi, convener of today's program. It gives an immense pleasure to brief opening report of the webinar. I'm very happy to inform you that we have received a very good response from various colleagues. NNTs, IITs, industries, and pollution control board members. 
were doing best possible success in education sector. It is responsibility to host this kind of programs so that all the people who are researching for should be brought at one place. Deliberations and good outcomes can come. We aim to provide a unique communication and discussion platform for environmental scientists as well as any discipline of science aiming the protection of the environment. As we all know that most people on the planet worry only about their family, about their own families and some close friends and only for a short period and did not think about future millenniums. Billions of people wish to satisfy their requirements immediately and behave on the earth as if the future does not concern them. A few people think about problems of their city or country. We should become like those people. However, quite different thinking is necessary to ensure that the biosphere will survive. So I should like to express a hope that we all have to take responsibility to protect the environment. That's why we arranged this platform. The focus of the conference would be on state of the art technologies and advances in solid waste management. These programs will provide a remarkable opportunity for the academic, research, and industrial communities to yes. address to and share solutions and discuss future research directions in the above field. Planning the waste management and recycling for all the waste produced is an enormous task which involves both logistical planning and scientific knowledge and understanding in order to balance the impact of the environment and the cost effectiveness of the process. Different valorization techniques are currently showing great hope and promise in meeting industrial demands. Among these promising waste valorization strategies is to employ flow chemical technology to process into valuable products. In this connection, today we have innovative lectures from experts we have who have contributed their valuable time to find ways to fight the persistent menace of pollution. Now I request the participant to I now I request the participants to actively participate and have a full discussion with the experts and make this program a grand success. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. V. Meena to take the opportunity to tell us about Professor GJV Jagannath Raju Foundation. Good morning to one and all. I, Professor Meena, co convener of today's program. It gives an immense pleasure to say a few words about Professor GJV Jagannath Raju Foundation. Professor Jagannath Raju Garu is the founder of Professor GJV Jagannath Raju Foundation. He is executed on 22nd of November 1994 to engage research and development of science and technology in general and more practically technical education. Professor Jagannath Raju Garu was born on January 4th, 1932. He was done his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Chemical Technology. He is honored by two doctoral degrees in Chemical Engineering. He has over 50 years of distinguished professional career as a member of faculty of Andhra University from 1954, working in different capacities, which include the positions of Professor, Head of the Department, Faculty Chairman and Rector, till 1986. Professor GJV Jagannath Rajgaru functioned as Vice Chancellor of Nagarjuna University, Chairman of AP State Council of Higher Education, Visiting Faculty IIT Madras, and Eminent Fellow UGC. He was also the Vice Chancellor of Sri Chandar Shekharendra Saraswati Mahavidyalaya Kanchipuram, he guided several candidates for the award of PhD degrees and published over 100 papers in national and international journals. He was principal investigator for several sponsored research projects. He was consultant for several industrial organizations, including Defense Establishment and EDCIL, and for a few projects, including quality audit of police training programs. He was prized and received several awards like Heredelia Award 1983, Government of Andhra Pradesh State Award for Meritorious Teachers, and Honorary Fellow from ISTE in appreciation of excellent contributions made by Professor Rajgaru for over five decades 
towards chemical engineering education and research in the country, Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers presented Dr. B.P. Godre's Lifetime Achievement Award 2009. Thank you one and all for giving this opportunity. Thank you, Meena, for introducing such a great personality and about his family. Now it's time to start a one-day international webinar on recycling solid waste management with great Professor great. GJV Jagannathraju Endowment Lecture, delivered by inspirational personality, Dr. Prakasham Tata Garu. A small note to the participant, those who cannot join through WebEx can join through YouTube link also. Now I request Professor Meena to introduce Dr. Tata Prakasham Garu. It is pride privilege to introduce Dr. Prakashan Tathagari. Dr. Prakashan Tathagari is a board certified environmental scientist with six decades of teaching, research, and professional experience in the field of water, wastewater treatment, and water quality area. He obtained his PhD from Rutgers University and served as a faculty of Kernan University for eight years. At the invitation of Metro Water Reclamination District of Greater Chicago, he joined in R&D department and retired as assistant director and head of the environmental research and monitoring division after 30 years of service. Dr. Prakashan Tata Garu has numerous publications and co-authored four books. He consulted with various national and international organizations such as UNDP, USAID, World Bank, National Academy of Science. He is a member of American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists and the recipient of Edward Clary Award. He is a Water Environment Federation Fellow and served as various committees of Water Environment Federation. Dr. Prakasham Tata Garu received many awards, including two Lifetime Achievement Awards and the prestigious Illis Island Medal of Honor. He is an active Rotarian and a life member of Water and Sanitization Rotary Action Group and is the chairman of North American Central Region of Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group. He is the Executive Director of Center for the Transformation of Waste Technology and the President of Bharati Tirtha, which are non-profit organizations dedicated for the improvement of education, environment, and health of the poor. He is instrumental in doing several humanization projects in the field of remediating pollution of water bodies, troubleshooting bodies, relating to operation and maintenance of wastewater treatment plants, and remediation of river and lake pollution to improve the environment and health of the poor. Thank you. Thank you, Meena. May I now request Dr. Prakashan Tata Garu, Executive Director, Center of the Transformation of Waste Technology, Naparvili, USC, to deliver Professor GJB Jagannath Raju Foundation Endowment Lecture on Circular Economy and Solid Waste Management. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. The great land of Chicago. Uh, today is a very auspicious day. On this day, 128 years ago, Swami Vivekananda roared in Chicago like a lion about the Indian heritage. 128 years today, you are honoring me to invite this lecture on this very auspicious day. It's a fantastic day. It's a very auspicious one. I hope the solid waste management in India will be turned a new leaf uh, with the eminent support of the chemical engineering department of the university. Thank you, professors. <laughs> Thanks, Devi, for inviting me. Of course, I must thank the Pat Gunns and the uh, Chief Passion of the University, Professor Prasad Garu, and others that assisted in the formulation of this particular conference, very timely conference of solid waste management. And uh, with, with the whole world is talking about environmental cleanup, 
believe it or not, a lot of talks are happening these days. That was my prayer. And my prayers were answered after so many decades when I was even talking to my even sister about the water scarcity. They wouldn't believe it. And I was a, uh, actually working in the field in Bengal and uh, West Bengal and uh, Maharashtra. But I'm so fortunate that this field is getting the uh, recognition and the exposure that is supposed to get even 40 years ago. And we have to, don't have to face this water pollution and uh, scarcity of water. And thank you, all of you, the students, who are particularly attending more than 550 people, I could see the participants, which is remarkable attendance. And this proves the success of the seminar on grid. And I thank everybody that is present here. For me, it now is 11.30 in the evening uh, of, of, of September 15th, whereas you're already in the 16th. So let me begin my um, talk here. I thought I took the, took the control of it. So why am I not able to change it? Could you help me? Somebody there? Yeah, there. Put, put it uh, back in the, in, the, in the first slide, please. I thought I want control on this one. Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. I think it's visible, but I'm not able to move it. it was, I was able to move it in the rehearsal. Yeah, it was moving, sir. Now, now the yeah. outline presentation. Yes. You see, um, I'm going to just present to you a small outline of presentation here, which starts with an introduction telling of the status of solid waste uh, in India, in the world, and, and in India, and particularly in Vishakhapatnam also. And we'll talk about these days uh, a very Great. fashionable word, uh, what is circular economy is being used. And then what is the, what it is, we'll define it a little bit. And then we'll compare it to so-called a linear economy. And then we'll talk about some components of this circular economy, what they are. And then we'll talk about application of circular economy principles to waste management. And we'll briefly touch upon the technologies of solid waste management. And of course, for anything that you do, there are always barriers. There are some naysayers and so forth. And we'll talk a little bit about the barriers and how to work on the operations, I mean, the opportunities for adaptation and adoption of this circular economy. Team. And we'll look at the path forward. And then we'll talk specifically about Vishakhapatnam, the smart meeting, the making, because I belong to that region. I have a love for this area, although I left the uh, Indian subcontinent uh, something like 59 years ago. I love it. I'm a frequent visitor uh, to India, particularly the region of Vijayanagar and Vishakhapatnam. I've gone there, and also Hyderabad, uh, the Telugu-speaking areas, and other areas where I have friends. I join hands with them to do some work. Tonight. So we'll talk about some of the solid-based management in uh, Chicago, the potential application of circular economy principles, and the kind of uh, volunteerism that I'm promoting in that area. And I close with some personal remarks at the end of the presentation. Next one, please. So the world generates about, again, a question about these numbers. When you read any literature, you read a lot of numbers uh, throwing, being thrown at you. And which number you believe? Because as practicing engineers, and I started as an engineer, as, my, as a scientist, let me tell you, my background was. And uh, believe it or not, all my life I've been working with engineers. So in a way, I, I, I became a crossbreed between the scientists and the engineers, I think very practically. But, Things up to. Can we use it for application engineering principles and make things happen? So in that regard, I work with numbers and all of you work with numbers. So unless we have good numbers, how do we work? So I'm throwing some numbers at you from the literature. I didn't collect them, but I have some reservations of these numbers in the literature when I see. India generates, when the world generates about 2.01 um, billion tons of municipal solid waste annually. India generates in urban areas, according to CPCB records, 147,613 tons per, of solid waste per day. That means so many millions of tons, 54 million tons per year, and 84,475 watts. Do you know how many uh, watts in the Vishakhapatnam are? There are 98 of them, believe it or not. Of all the states in India, January 2020. India generates in its rural areas about 109.5 to 126 tons of organic and recyclable waste. This again to a report recently of a report in 2012. And these numbers again, they might change here because India maybe 
the people from rural areas are migrating to urban areas, there may be some reduction in that, but that more is added to the uh, urban areas. 16 million tons of solid waste from agriculture and uh, 10 to 15 million. Solid waste, also, as solid waste also. The dung and excreta from chickens and other farm animals added to the solid waste problem in rural areas. Next, please. Look at. Uh, in some of the 29 states of India, or the, some of the uh, 29 states of India, what is the solid uh, waste management status? Door to door collection, 18 states out of 29. There's so much to be done in the other 11 states, obviously. Solid waste generated, so many tons per day, I told you. Solid waste collected, although it was generated, only 76% is collected. Solid waste processed, processed and treated, a very fraction of that, 24.6% only. So there's a lot of work to do. Segregation of cells only only five states. Twenty nine states don't do it. Um, of the twenty nine states, unsanitary land is constructed. These are like dump, dump sites. Twelve hundred eighty five. Operating pipe composting facilities. There are at least some people who think composting is a severe, so they're composting and seven thousand pits are there. The pipes are there. Operating refuse derived fuel facilities. These are made out of any combustible materials. They are really compressed and make like some small pellets so that they can burn. And that, that is called refuse derived fuel. And uh, there are 12 facilities according to this estimate. Operating biogas plant 645. Obviously, uh, these are the plants, I think, on the industrial scale or big scale they're operating. Because at the time when I was I mean, when I was when I was young man like you working in India, I know there are 160,000 backyard um, cow dung gas plants. And I myself built one in 1961 in, in my lab uh, to demonstrate, you know, to the local people at the Borivili Kora Kendra uh, Gramo Jog Center to show the, the, the feasibility of producing uh, gobber gas uh, to the students in that campus. Um, that plant was working maybe 10 years ago. I visited still working at that time. I don't know the status of that right now. The energy generation plants waste to energy. There are 11 of them, only six are operational. Next one, please. Can I move on to the next one? Mine is not working, I don't know. Okay. When you compare the developed country cities and the Indian, like for example, like in India, an emerging economy with the typical Indian, uh, cities that are compared to developed countries you can see that one significant thing that just immediately strikes out from these uh, pie charts is that you see the biodegradable waste is green one is almost like half more than half oh, in Indian yeah. cities whereas it is a, it is about 20 percent only in comparison to this one because of the development of these countries you know more more of the paper plastic and the glass and this kind of stuff is wasted as solid waste uh, and here in our country, in India, uh, a significant a majority of that solid waste is very uh, biodegradable. This one thing. Next one, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go, go to the forward. Maybe it's working now for me. Okay. Now, if you look at the regions of the world, take South Asia, for example. The average user fuel that we generate, everything is an economical condition now. If you produce waste, you have to dispose it of somehow, it involves some cost. So if you compare the costs around the world, uh, this is a World Bank report, very recent one, 2018. South Asia rates very low, $34 per, um, per year as reported uh, as the user fee um, in South Asia. Which includes, of course, uh, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and uh, uh, Sri Lanka. Sub Saharan regions that are poor also, they do generate a very uh, small quantities of waste, and also there's a poor country. Poor countries are there. So they range between $10 and $40 per ton. The typical waste management cost by disposal, you can see this for various 
types of operations, low income countries versus the high income at the other end, you can compare $20 to $50 for collection and transfer, control landfills, $10 to $20, open dumping, $2 to $8. That, that's the prevalent thing, really. And of course, that's not available in other countries because there's no open dumping that happens in other countries. That, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I saw open dumps in the United States also. So it's not available. And the recycling, if you look at it, that is the, supposed to be the uh, the biggest opportunity for us in India and other developing countries. Almost like low-income countries, is 0 to 25%. Where in the developed countries, high-income countries, 30 to 80%. Composting, 5 to 30% in uh, low-income countries versus 35 to $90 in the high income countries you can multiply this approximately by 70 rupees per uh, per dollar these days i think so what is circular economy let's talk about that for a little bit circular economy it is nothing but an industrial economy that relies on the restorative capacity of natural resources and aims to minimize if not eliminate the waste we want to put some economical value to these resources and we utilize the renewable sources of energy and phase out the use of harmful substances. Ellen MacArthur Foundation is located in Chicago, and they're, they, have champ they are championing the cause of uh, waste disorder, particularly the plastic waste as a solid waste. It's an economic system that uses systematic approach to maintain a circular flow of resources by regenerating, retaining, or adding to their value while contributing to sustainable development. Again, this is a phrase that, that has been used for the last two, three decades, sustainable development. We don't want to uh, spoil our environment and hand it over to our next generation uh, in, in, in a condition that, they, that, that we spoiled it, and then we hand it over to them for them to repair. Our idea is to give it to them as we found it in a better condition. Then again, we, talk, we hear the terms like circularity. It is a state of say, a specified system or organization product or process where resource flows and values are maintained while it's benefiting sustainable development. Circularity performance, of course, anything we can define, it only matters when we define it. The, define the performance of a system. We can build systems, but how efficient they are. Are they functioning? Uh, are they being maintained properly or not? It all depends on the maintenance and operations, so the performance of it. Degree to which a specific system, organization, product, or process represent the state where resource flows and values are maintained was benefiting sustainable development. This is the way that uh, Siram Ramakrishna, a native of Vishakhapatnam, who is a professor at Singapore University, defined it. Look at circular versus very easy to understand. You produce resources from resources and produce some goods. We use them and we throw them away. Make, use, throw. This is the system. Linear. One way only goes to the dump. Now, your economy is where you think the products can be recycled, reused, repaired, remaintained, and then recovered. Of all these things you do, maintain the life cycle of that particular product for a long period of time, and only at the end of the life cycle, only you eliminate the amount of waste is wasted. That is circular economy principles. We will deal with it in a more elaborate way here. See. A systematic approach to economic development. In circular economy, you're always thinking of waste of resources and valuable resources. There's a value to them. It's never a waste. To me, I always believe waste of resources. Let's go back to the other slide. Uh, so those are the uh, valuable resources. How to extract all the value before I completely take the juice out of it and throw it a little bit. We take like this and we throw it, throw it away a little bit. That's the way we want it then. In that case, the principles are involved, like design system to reduce and even eliminate waste that cause pollution. This is where engineers come in. Chemical engineers are very well suited for any of these processes. And keep products and materials in use and regenerate the natural systems. Its principles can be applied to manage waste originating from industries, humans, and animals to derive economic benefits. Nothing is a waste. I, I, as a matter of fact, when I was a child, there was a lot of circular economy principles, my mom, mother, and grandmother, and aunt are following that. I will explain to you a bit when I talk about waste treatment. Linear economy principles, take, make, and throw as a waste. This is simple. Very easy for all of us to throw the kind of stuff. 
and the rules and strict. Next one. What are the benefits of a practice circular economy principles? Manufacturing industries have started using circular economy principles. They have begun to accrue benefits. Now it is built in more or less in any industrial process in its life cycle, how to make effective use of resources, make a lot of money and waste a little. That's all. That is the principle of the major principle. You can remember that. According to Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the United Nations Conference yeah. on Trade Development, India can benefit. Please, I, Please. Want, I, request, I, I you, want, uh, request the students to remember these numbers. These numbers, if we practice in India, circular economy principles, 42 lakh crores are 5 to 624 billion dollars by practicing circular economy principles, equivalent to 30 percent of the gross domestic products. You can see how much we are throwing it away. What is the potential? You chemical engineers are well suited for this. Annual losses due to soil degradation is 35,000 crores. Approximately five four billion dollars. If carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus from the biosolids are the residuals that are obtained by wastewater treatment uh, plants and so forth, obtained from wastewater, a significant amount of money can be saved by not buying commercial fertilizers. This is another advantage by following its economy, circular economy principles. Linear economy, look like at wastewater treatment. The influent wastewater comes to your treatment plant, and then what does it do? It produces a clean effluent complying theoretically the effluent discharge standards, and the effluent is discharged into streams and rivers and water bodies. And in that process also sludge is produced and the sludge is disposed of. And uh, there is no effort to create any wealth in most treatment plants. But now they are thinking about it in a lot of plants to create energy. This is a conventional sewage treatment plant. I just gave a schematic here. Treatment, effluent, discharging of streams, a disposal, uh, that look at this treatment on the solid side that are contained in sewage. You get the sludge out of it, of the treatment. A lot of it is oxidized and uh, digested sludge you get, and that can be used as a fertilizer and, and uh, so on and so forth. In the circular economy, uh, that is the sewage treatment on the left hand side you're seeing in the diagram. In the sewage treatment plant, the recycling of effluent and biosolids, you can do a lot of things. Now, we are seeing the value of the biosolids in the last two decades. And the, the water reclamation district, where work, one of my major works involved in the utilization of biosolids. And we reclaim a lot of land, mine spoil land in southern Illinois, coal mine spoilers, and things like that. You can do a lot of things and grow, again, bring them back to greening and then grow a lot of crops over there. We can do that. And same thing with the effluent also. We take the water from Lake Michigan and we use it, we make it wastewater, and then we treat it, and then we get the clean effluent, and we can irrigate crops to it or send it to uh, receiving waters like. Uh, we have a channel system. I'll mention with you in a little bit. Very close. Solid waste management, linear economy. We take the resource and make products out of it, use them, consume it, and then throw it away. Very simple. And now, this is an interesting diagram if you see this. This is uh, called the butterfly, the, the very famous butterfly diagram, which is uh, created by the Allen Mac, Mac, uh, MacArthur Foundation. On the left-hand side of the cycle, these are very tiny letters. Maybe you, you will not be able to see that in detail letters. I mean, uh, in, uh, can you magnify these things somewhat? Zoom it? I don't think so. But anyway, on the left-hand side, the biological cycles. On the right-hand side, the technical cycles. Meaning, the biological cycles in with the biodegradable compounds, anything or to do with organic, as I mentioned to you, you can make a lot of products. You can reuse them, uh, uh, compost and, and whatnot. You can do that, and you can make organic uh, products like you can grow corn using this and then make ethanol and stuff like that and then recycle them into back to the industries so on and so forth. on the right hand side when you look at technical stuff these are manufactured goods you manufacture a lot of goods again those goods previously what you throw them away after the use is done now they are willing to design to actually get you get material value for it to, to do this technically so again, there are so many things we can show these things in a more detailed way, I hope in another diagram here. Then you told what it is they're saying is you make it recycle, reuse, refine, uh, redesign, and put it back into manufactured products. You know, like as uh, Dr. Srinivas Rao was telling me, telling us a little while ago, and his opening remarks, how the electronic waste and all these things are retrieving the metals and 
creating value out of the electronic waste and things like that. So on the technical side, here again, chemical engineers are well suited. They know in reaction engineering, chemical kinetics, and how to re design reactors to make things happen. For example, if you make a polystyrene, you can depolymerize it into styrene demonomer. And things of this nature can, can be put back into the manufacturing process. So on an industrial scale, making products on the right hand side, you can do this. Components of circular economy. See that one. There are six hours. Again, Walter Stahel, he wrote a book uh, just uh, in, in the guidance of the MacArthur Art Foundation. He was an advisor to them. They bought a book. In this, he mentioned uh, circular economy users gathered is the name of the book. There are six R's, he said. Reuse the things, repair the things, remarket them. I mean, you can use it. I mean, yesterday in our neighborhood, we have a garage sale. All the neighbors brought their furniture, uh, utensils that they're sick of using it. They're very good. And they put them there, they're shiny, and the clothes and everything, they put there as a garage sale. The, the furniture went away like uh, hotcakes. People liked it. Some of them old silver. Where just so my neighbor was telling me he sold his silverware for six hundred dollars because that was old. Their grandmother or somebody gave it. There is no use for them, so they remarket, it, remanufacture. You can do remanufacturing and produce uh, again fresh goods and refine them. You don't have to do anything. Just polish them and uh, refine them, and you can sell them. Reprogram the goods. If the goods you know can take it out and reprogram to do other things. So that is what the six R's are the circular economy principle. There are a lot of examples. Uh, we don't have time to go through those examples. But just to get the principle. Now there are six D's. Now depolymerize it to the plastic waste, such as styrofoam and others, I told you. Acrylic materials. These can be depolymerized. There are a lot of research is going on there to make these things. How to get these monomers? Again, use them as a feed products, uh, feedstock materials to an industrial operation. D alloy, the metal waste. Delaminated, laminated products. You know they may, they may be wood. Then you, you do apply plastic to it with some kind of a glue. You laminate everything, and then you could delaminate things. Those plastics can be taken out, and the wood can be used again. Devulcanize. I mean, this is a great industry. I know in India, the rubber tires, for example, is a great uh, great thing. A lot of used tires, they revulcanize, they use them again. Decoding. I mean, you have coated the materials with a lot of paints, and you descale them with the paint, and you can use them again. Uh, deconstruct. Now this is the construction and demolition derby that you the debris that you have and a uh, lot of it is thrown away into low level areas it, it creates ugly mounds of waste and nobody does anything about it and actually there are things that you can do to make uh, again construction materials from these uh, uh, this construction and, and uh, demolished waste uh, buildings you know the waste from coming from that and then the materials from there the steel uh, and uh, the other things can be sold. The windows and things like that uh, can be sold in a in another market. There is a market like that in India. I know that. Now let us explore how circular economy principle can be applied to waste management. Here I'm giving you two examples. One is the place where I'm in Chicago, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago, which is perhaps uh, the largest treatment plant in the world at one time. Maybe there are one or two other plants equal to it. Um, in Chicago, I've been fortunate to work here for 30 years and also make good things happen here. And on, this, like, on the right hand side, you can see our own Vishakapatnam, uh, where Commissioner Srijana was visiting a dump site. And the, 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 the top one is a picture of the dump site. And then the right hand side of the picture, the volunteers with whom I work. I'm rubbing shoulders with these youngsters every year during my annual, annual visit to do some things for Vishakapatnam. I'll talk to you towards the end of my lecture. Wastewater treatment resource recovery system. This is a paper I published in 1992, thinking I always believed waste of resources. There's nothing to be wasted. You, you collect the waste, you get, there's a pre-treatment process, and through the wastewater treatment process, you know, you can get the sludge and all that. We can conduct it to kind of make it in order to make it digested, and you get the biogas, which is an energy source. And then you get the residue, there's a fertilizer, and you can grow crops. That crop can be eaten by animals or humans and things like that. And then Again, we produce waste that can be recycled this way, and then the process starts again. And then, and the residue comprises of solids and it is also the liquid. Taking the liquid waste that was the effluence coming from the wastewater treatment system, 
you can develop aquaculture, growing fish and algae. And fish can be used for uh, human consumption. Some people have the uh, the fish grown on sewage. Uh, they can, it can be converted into animal feed. And, uh, uh, and then from the aquaculture, all the effluent also can be used for irrigation to grow crops again. And when storm water, we get monsoon weather, not uh, is uh, storm water. It goes to the uh, it goes to the drains ultimately to the sea, I guess. If we don't collect it and store it, and then it, it can be done here again in engineering solution for the storm water, the flooding, all that thing happens. We don't have a good flooding. Uh, anti-flooding uh, kind of programs for us. This is the area that I think we, we, we should examine very thoroughly because all the water comes in during monsoon and that comes up in storm water and it has to be collected. You can do two things only with water, very cost effectively. That is storage and pumping. I mean, you can desalinate sea water and all that kind of thing. 97% of the water is sea, but it's very expensive. So why don't we conserve our own uh, waters that is there in a, in, in a hydrologic cycle that we can do? Now, let us see the hierarchy of the soil waste management. You, if you don't do anything with it, you end up in unsanitary landfills open, uh, burning at the bottom of the pyramid here. And then there are landfills that do not capture methane. You see, when you, when you do put everything in a dump in the solid waste, there are decomposed materials because it's highly, it becomes aerobic. There's no oxygen supply to it. Then what happens is, uh, according to the metabolism, the end, metabolism, the end, product, the end product is methane and carbon dioxide and water and ammonia and hydrogen sulfur and things like that. And so if you capture the methane, that will be actually used, can be used as a fuel. There are now modern landfills that are recovering um, methane from the, from the sealed uh, solid waste management facilities. facilities. Then that, and there are now actually plants being built phase to energy. As you know, there's one being built by Zindal, I think, in um, in Vishakhapatnam. Um, they're converting the uh, solid waste into energy. There is aerobic compost. You can do that. And also anaerobic composting. And then these things can be uh, the source for separated organics. You know, you have to take the organics out of it, biodegradability that you can do with that. And then recycling, and ultimately waste reduction. There is a little bit of waste that still remains if you practice all these things from the bottom of the pyramid and you do that. First of all, you have to go, you can, you can start from the pyramid top, waste reduction, recycling, composting, waste energy, and all these things you can do. If you can't do anything, then unsanitary land will result in open dumping. That's what happens. Now, if you look at the other hierarchy, the technology interventions you can do, as I mentioned to you. Waste to energy, you can do this uh, gasification, pyrolysis, refuse derived fuels, and incineration. You can do this. Mineral composting and baby composting. Now, it's a very lot of people are practicing this in India also, you know. And uh, again, the small scale uh, biomethanation systems and large scale biomethanation systems, I told you with Kaudang uh, at one time during my time in India, they were building so many uh, Kaudang biogas plants giving some subsidies and things like that. I was involved in, in a program like that. Um, and anaerobic, aerobic, uh, anaerobic composting, aerobic composting, I told you, that recycling, oh, this is a method. Again, I just want to segment this pyramid. This is a, a thesis um, done by one of the Indian uh, students at the Columbia University in, in New York City. Now, that in agriculture, also the circular economy. If you look at it, you, you have the animals and they produce manure, and then you can grow the crops and using the manure as a fertilizer. Then as the animal feeds also can be produced in the uh, crops that you grow. And again, they eat the animals, the sucker thing, thing, thing. So what are the products in the agriculture mainly? The animal feed, you go in there as fertilizer as inputs, output is meat and milk primarily. Okay, and there are byproducts that you can get out of it, even, as early as in 1950s or earlier that, even uh, in, uh, SC, uh, Professor S.C. Pillai in Bangalore extracted vitamin B12 from sewage sludge. You know, it's very interesting. There are so many chemicals that you can produce out of sewage, but it is ugly to work with. Now everybody's talking about sewage, wastewater, that kind of stuff. How many of you have heard 50 years ago or 60 years ago about this kind of a field in India? Not many. But we create our problems and then we try to solve them. If you if you don't create it, there is no reason for you to solve it. 
But that's what's going to happen in the future. Going next slide. So technology for solid waste men. I just put a slide here to look for some greenery here. The objective of this technology is used for liquid and solid waste management should be to minimize the quantity of solid waste to be disposed and value to add value to the waste and use them as resources, minimize air, water, and soil pollution, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and greening of the environment that we live in and support the achievement of sustainable development goals. This is the concept of all of the technologies that are used for solid waste management. Next slide. Uh, these are the technologies that are there. Uh, 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 just enumerated things. There are physical methods and chemical methods and biological methods. The physical methods involve mechanical processes like disassembling, crushing, grinding, pulverizing, uh, etc. into powders and use the materials again for construction and so on and so forth. Particularly is applicable for uh, construction uh, debris type of uh, materials, you know, any, any other um, um, debris that you can get. And thermal process, of course, here you need uh, a waste uh, which has some carbon content and calorific value in it. If there's no calorific value, it's even not wise to think about incineration. I experienced one, one thing many years ago, something like 35 years ago, Denmark and Sweden donated a plant to Delhi to incinerate its waste. Mm -hmm. Guess what? The solid waste dump, I visited it. And I saw the treatment plant also, the incineration plant also. And it is not functioning because there's no calorific value in the garbage. Because the garbage was sorted out by rag pickers. Everything, there's a value they took it out. They left out with, with some debris and material that doesn't burn. So if that is the you, that is the feed that you're going to put in the incinerator, there are problems also. They were putting in diesel oil to burn the waste, and that is far forming some stalagmites and stalactites within the refractories of the incinerator. So it won't function. There's no heat transfer. The efficiency is very minimal. So as engineers, we should think before we start what kind of a process is really relevant. The chemical processes, again, again, depolymerization, alkaline degradation, defrosting, crystallization for recyclable materials. You can't use some other processes with their... their highly inorganic, mm -hmm. you can't compost them, you cannot degrade them, that you are handled by chemical process only. As uh, Dr. Srinivasara Rao was telling in the beginning, uh, how do you extract lithium, cadmium, or something like that. Only the the prints that. Biological process, process, yes. Where you have degradable materials, biodegradable, and enzymatic processes, that the other technology you can use. I am a Gali and juicy screen of one just and uh, barriers. Oh, there are always, there are always there problems, there are barriers for adoption. If you say something in any meeting, my profile guru is used for a while. There is a martyr from our name, sir. At the box, no matter from that, our other friends. I'm sorry, sir. Somebody is interfering here. Um, if you propose something. We have a friendly discussion, sometimes the heated discussions. Somebody is always, there is a naysayer. They say there is a barrier to it. Why should we do this? I'm a pragmatist. I'm a practitioner. I'm an optimist. So I would like to see the barriers first and uh, how to uh, answer these barriers before I go into a discussion. First of all, you have to change the attitude and behavior of people. If you go there, this can't be done. That is my thing. Nothing can be done. If you want to move Mount Everest, you know, say, I can't do it. No, no, I'm not inefficient. Fine. But look at tonight. Actually, in America, four civilians are going to, into the orbit. They're going to be flying into this man-made um, rocket, 360 miles above Earth. The first rocket to go there. The humans are doing it. So if I say, no, we can't do it. I mean, they, they have done it. They're going to do it. India put in 130 satellites with one rocket. It can be done. So if you say some naysayer that it cannot be done, it will never be done. If that guy is particularly in power, forget it. It won't happen. Lack of information mm -hmm. and awareness. This is the other thing we have to do as students of chemical engineering or in engineering or in science. We have to. We have to, if you are going to choose this profession, environmentalism, you have to be make people aware of you know the economic and health benefits. That then with people, I, in my own life experience, I did it, holding hands in Vijayanagaram. And I built a wastewater treatment system 
with what we've been combined into it. Even before Modi ji declared open defecation, the spice policy, I did it. If Prakash Sara, a measly fellow who is not influential at all, can do it, why can't you do it? That's my question to all of you students tomorrow when you become big. Inadequate private and public support for the NGOs, non government organizations. There are profit making organizations, but non profit making organizations also there. And there, there's no uh, support to a lot of these things. Why? Because we're reluctant to give some of them very fraudulent. They waste your money, your hard earned money. I know that. And you want to give hard earned money to an unknown God that you don't see, or to some relevant person whom you have trust, like Ramakrishna Mission or some other mission. Lions Club or Rotary Club or something like that. You do that. So lack of targeted guidance to small scale and medium enterprises and large scale industries to practice circular economy principles. It's going to happen because when disasters happen, then only we react. When we're buried in waste, then we'll do something about it. Otherwise, you know, manana, tomorrow, let somebody take care of it. The municipality will take care of it, not me. That can be. Lack of motivation. There's no motivation, no incentives to do anything. This is another barrier. Competing priorities and lack of finances. If I'm hungry, how can I preach peace? My stomach is empty. So let me fill my stomach first. That's a priority. My first prayer, I learned it in my job too. When I first started at the age of 19 in rural Bengal, I learned it. The first thing is priority. The people didn't leave, need the trees. You know, I, I want to go to the, uh, my field, agricultural field. You want to come back to my village to do, to do the modification? I can't do it because I walked for four miles to my field. I want to find a place, place there and just clean myself over there. I didn't think about the priority. My priority is research on latrines and septic tanks. I never thought about that a priority. That priority, I wanted to give them free things, but they don't want it because his priority is to produce food for his kids and family. I never thought about it, but the guy opened my eyes. So when I asked him my job, somebody asked for an equipment, a half a million dollar worth of equipment, I asked him, do you really need it? Prove it to me. Then I'll fight for you. Otherwise, forget it. That's the kind of attitude it took. Lack of learning from that little individual in Singur in West Bengal, I learned that. Today, even today, I don't forget it. Lack of adequate number of trained personnel with technical skills. We're all technicians, but we don't want to dirty our hands in. We, everybody wants to work in an air-conditioned office. Is that possible? You're geniuses. You're engineers. We can go into the field, hold hands with the operators, and we train them, and we have to do it. And this is a barrier. We don't do that. Not much. I've seen, I walked in India to treatment plants. That's my, not my job. Nobody paid me a dime. I did it. Why? I'm passionate about it. To see what in what way I can help my country when I'm there. But let them, but, you know. Lack of appropriate machinery and tools. We don't have the machinery and tools. We want the one, the most advanced thing that doesn't work in the first place. We don't have the repairing parts or uh, parts for it. And what the equipment we have, we don't know how to handle it properly. And those kinds of things are barriers for some people. Union demands and politics. If unions are employed for regular solid based managed field, you know that we Vishakapatnam, the union strike, then the garbage builds up, and the commissioner, the health officer, every runs. You know, this is sad, but that is the reality. We have to do that. And corruption, of course, I need I don't need to even touch it. Opportunities. I'm a pragmatist. I'm a born optimist. I look at when I see a pile of dung, my God, a great opportunity to produce biogas. That's the way I think about it. Oh, there. Oh, sorry. I'm coming very close to my end. So there are plenty of opportunities, you know, implementing separation at source in rural and urban areas and possible urban rural integration, waste as resource and management, converting dumps into secular landfills and sealing them properly and collecting biogas for energy. Development of skilled personnel for treating and managing solid and liquid facilities. Here, I have a prayer to the God that I believe in that we should train, India should train skilled personnels, personnel for treating the waste. There are a lot of treatment plants that are being built. I mean, liquid to process sewage and things like that. But my observation really? is they fail in a short time because of lack of skilled people. Let us let the university, Andhra University, develop a program for training operators and also influence the state and central governments to have them as good paid workers to operate. They will be very reasonable to you, very, very loyal to you to operate. They don't, don't run away because somebody else is going to give another 10 rupees more. They want to live in their land. 
I would have lived in my land, back up a job up and liking. I started my job 65 years ago in wastewater and sanitation. Who said, who cared for sanitation at that time? That's the kind of a feeling I had. So I'm very passionate about it, that these guys should be paid adequately so that they can stay in one place, learn it and operate. They're very smart people. I know that. Very smart, extremely smart. The farmers and everybody else. And to increase the monitoring and extended product res producer responsibility. Now, this is a new thing. And uh, in Europe, you know, uh, for the development, then the, let the responsibility put on the producer. When they manufacture a product, that product, they have to take the liability of it from the, the whole of life chain, life cycle of the thing. They have to take care of the treatment of the waste that they generate or what they produce. Like a washing machine, if they create, they have to take it back, then not in the junkyard, but they have to take it somehow. So they create it such that it would work for a long time. And then there is a remarkable uh, resale value for it. Some other people can buy it and use the equipment. So that's something like that. Um, sustainable operations do proper planning and financial arrangements. Everything. You need some passion to do things and you need finances. University professors need money to do projects. They should have the passion to do work. You things are needed. If you are not passionate, you will not obtain money. When you obtain money, there should not be any grant. They should support you. Not asking trivial questions. So how much you spend for your coffee or tea, refreshments? This is trivial. They have to be supported. We said to be supported by universities, by the government, by the private industry. They've got smart professors. I talk with people there. You're very smart. But I stopped there because you are discouraged in some way not to proceed further. I urge the established Andre University, great university. It's a phenomenal, you know, 1926 established. It's a, it's a pioneer in a lot of things. They can support innovation activities. Not that I'm saying they're not doing that, but they can do it more using their influence. That's what I'm saying. Control of potential pollution from incinerators and pyrolysis units. And this is another thing because somebody says you want to do pyrolysis and incinerate it. Watch out. If you don't control it, you produce dioxins and other pollutants, which are even more dangerous than the garbage itself. Then we'll take out that. Now, let me switch gears here. We talk about smart city. Governments cannot do it alone. I'm telling you again, government agencies cannot do it alone. We produce the garbage. Municipality picks it up. There is a strike. What are they going to do? They cannot do it alone. We have to support the government agencies to do that. Give a little and you will bless more. Maybe Shakapatnam, that's my prayer, be the best smart city in India. When we look at the benchmarks, you know, and then what the current level. The benchmarks for a smart city are 100%, are high demand, I mean, the high supply of water and so forth. And here are the numbers. Do I trust these numbers? I don't know because I have not collected them. The current level, when you look at household connections, 100% for the water supply. Now they, they reported only some 35%. Maybe there are more from the reporting date. There's a consultant in 2014 that did the survey for Deloitte, I think. I talked with him personally for this seminar, for this webinar. So he mentioned to me, sir, I don't know whether the numbers given to me. I put in there. All these benchmarks are okay, maybe because I, I want my son to achieve 100% so that they go to med school or great engineering school or Stanford or whatever. But would that be would that happen? What is the current level or potential? Let's look at these numbers. Look at recycling of solid waste. One number I tell you, only 5%. 100% is the goal, target. It's a small numbers when you look at it. Look at the numbers I did, this, this PowerPoint is available to you later on, you can see in detail. This is update in 2015. Maybe some improvements have been made. Definitely there are improvements. I'm not denying that. I, I, I shouldn't deny that because, uh, because progress has been made, definitely. I can look at some, the, the next, next one here. The issues related to stakeholders and still in waste management, the citizens. Payment to sweeper and private collector segregation and wet and dry waste is an issue for citizens. GVMC, lack of staff. Unfortunately, this is a big problem. I, I go to municipalities just to learn. I went to GVMC. I compare it. It's a very smart city. Two million people, roughly. In Chicago, we have five million. Our staff, very meager. Inadequate pay. Increasing population. Lack of operating whales in vehicles and commensurate with the number of people. Labor union uh, problems. Corporators, exertion of control over the management of walk level sweeping and cleaning. 
NGOs, community-based and area-based organizations, collection and transfer of waste difficulties in working conditions, fiscal issues. They always everybody has a money problem. Waste pickers and employees employees of schemes, discrimination and complaints from citizens. We complain a lot. And what do you do? That is our best pastime: complaining, complaining, complaining. I'm sorry. That's what I see when I come there to care and part to walk with the other seniors. They always complain. I said, what the heck you're doing? You're such an intelligence force here. You're not even 60 years or 60, 65 of years of age. We can collectively do something. Let's do something. That's what I tell them when I go there. And private sweepers, lack of reliability, inadequate health and protection equipment. Poor guys. I, wa I watch these sweepers. I hold hands with them when I walk and care. I'm calling the big, big cities. Yeah. I tell them, Mama, you're doing great work. Thank God bless. You're blessed. Wear your masks when you're just sweeping the, the dust is entering into your mask. That's not good for your health. Tell them. And municipal sweepers, inadequate experience to assign areas by sweeping, lack of enforcement and performance of improper equipment. They don't have equipment. Inadequate health for sweepers. Sweepers may lose income because the scheme is introducing a new system using retrained waste pickers. So they are afraid of the tools. So I talked with them. My job was, sir, I'm not educated, I'm not trained, I may lose this job. Is afraid of that. Some these are the NGOs that are. I don't know how many of you know. These are the NGOs that are working in Vishakhapatnam. India Youth for Society, a not-for-profit organization. I support this organization. Vizag Bioenergy Fuel Private Limited. This just said got land over there to make tiles from plastic, and also they have biogas producing um, some uh, CBG, a compressed biogas. Marmidi Biomedical Waste Treatment as their general urban solid waste management, private limited, Zigma landfill clearances, their landfill clearances, construction debris, Pro Enviro Corporation, G Green Initiatives is a non for profit organization to make money out of waste. Let us talk a little bit about plastic waste. This is my heart right now. I work in a project. When you look at 240 uh, million tons of plastic waste is now thrown into the world, in, this is 2016, it is increasing every year. And there are the 24 trillion plastic bottles that are there in the ocean. Weight of 3.4 million adult blue whales. This is a World Bank report. Nice picture. And this is an effort I'm doing. A, a single man, Prakash Tara. I'm a Rotarian and I'm a giver. I'm doing this. An effort to apply circular economy principle to manage plastic waste in Visag. I don't know how many of you know this. There is a waste collection and processing initiative undertaken by the Rotary Clubs of Naperville. That's my club. There I'm a member. Bharati Tita is a small nonprofit organization. I'm the president of it. I run it. Uh, Rotary Club of Port City in Vishakhapatnam. India Youth for Society. Um, that's a nonprofit organization. I work with these youngsters. Almost every, every other day I talk to them. Uh, it's, a, it's a nonprofit organization. With the cooperation of GVMC, we're doing this work. I acknowledge that GVMC is supportive of this activity that we are doing. The main objectives are to buy and donate managed machinery to India Youth for Society for processing plastic waste to be collected by from four wards in Vishakhapatnam, just only four wards. And uh, to produce plastic chips and granules to sell to the bulk recyclers so that they can make some money in this India Youth. To generate employment for several unemployed youth in Vishakhapatnam city. I think according to our proposal, we can create about 25 um, people that we can offer employment in this project. The ultimate goal is replication of the project in other parts of Vishakhapatnam and in other parts of the world. I'm active in the Rotary. I mean, we talk about this as a plastic waste group, and there are a lot of problems around the world. And they say, hey, Prakash, you know, we need your help, that kind of thing. I get them. It, it, make my, it makes my day when somebody asks me, hey, I need your help. Who asked my help in India? Not many. Here, I just want to show you a little video. It is not opening up. Let me see. Oh, there. Oh, sorry. Get the next time. No sound coming. Can you make the sound there, please? 
See, it was playing before. Uh, this is a small video of 90 seconds we made to show that project in Vizag that you people can enjoy when it gets implemented. Uh, anyway, it's not working. So let me conclude my presentation with some uh, personal remarks. Uh, maybe later on, uh, you can see this video, the 90 second video. I can forward it to, um, to the management. Maybe Sri Devi can show it. Okay, sorry. Okay, let go. This is showing up, but the sound is not coming. Okay, concluding the statement, these are my personal observations. Oftentimes, you know, we hear from environmentalists, oh, this problem is increasing, blah, 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 blah. And they preach. Sorry, Humans will be buried in their own space, but then we continue. And these are so many uh, conferences were held to meet this. Uh, this now, now, now we have this decade sustainable development. Even the governments of rich countries cannot solve all these social, political problems, environmental problems because of pollution, climate change, poverty, and inter interregional conflicts about water, faith, etc. Because you need a commitment, you need the finances. Basically, we need two things. Fortunately, we have the tools and mechanisms to clean the environment to achieve accords between people, among people, among nations, and to achieve peace. We can do that by dialogue. However, are we willing to accepting them and achieve a peaceful and clean environment for our future generation to enjoy for the mess we are creating? I mean, this is the kind of a question my teachers, my professors pose to themselves and ask me in your generation, can will you do anything? I was motivated by you, like professors like you, and I'm doing my little part. And I re my request to the professors and the elite of Andhra University to motivate the students to do something for the university, for their grounds, to clean them up and so mm -hmm. forth. So all, if not most of you are born in European India, I was I born in a slave country. Do something to protect your independence, to live in a peaceful, clear environment. Again, I thank you all for giving this opportunity to say my heart, to speak my heart to you. And uh, bless you. God bless us all for us to do some good work. It's about 15% off. Thank you very much. On flights in the clear trip clear these days. Thank you. Okay, ma'am, I'm done. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any queries from participants? Dear, dear participants, as we are having limited time, very few queries can be answered. Any queries from participants? Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have uh, we have now a clear picture of how circular economy is beneficial in maintaining biodiversity and in optimized disposal of waste in a wealthy manner. And though the oh, time is convenient for you, you made your availability for delivering your lecture. This shows your interest and enthusiasm towards younger generation for giving the inputs to take further research studies in this field. Thank you, sir for your thought provoking lecture and taking your time to share your knowledge with us. We will definitely take your points into consideration. Thank you, sir. Thank you. May I now Thank you. CP Venkatrao, sir? What is, what is it? Yes, yes. Any queries, please? Please. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning or uh, good evening, Dr. Prakasham Garu, this is uh, Dr. W.R. Reddy from Hyderabad. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, thank you. And I, I was uh, keenly hearing your uh, uh, session. Uh, say what about I really appreciate, yeah, say I really what appreciate about... the co comprehensiveness uh, with which you have covered. Is a, is, a, is a broad overall picture which you have covered and I really appreciate uh in this sector what we lack i think you already started working at the grassroots level i think in this sector more and more such initiatives of course there are a lot of difficulties a lot of constraints roadblocks uh more and more such initiatives from bottom up that is the requirement of the day and number two I think uh, the involvement of the local bodies, of course, uh, you, you have uh, 
tried with the municipal corporation vijayanagaram uh, you you have of course mixed uh, uh, feedback on that i i i keep hearing uh, once in a while from you uh, but uh, i think uh, involving the local bodies is the way forward problem of uh, waste management solved at a local level is uh, going to be the solution you cannot uh, create a huge dump of uh, waste and then start uh, uh, treating it i think prevention is the best cure uh, uh, is, is is very re relevant in this uh, scenario also so rope in uh, the panchayats which of course uh, government of india had been doing uh, much more effort has to be there but panchayats and municipal corporations and so on and so forth uh, that has to happen and i think a great uh, uh a, a a a struggle has to start a revolution has to start in sensitizing the civil uh, the the civic uh, uh, sense of the citizens for example today i was i was walking through a road uh, along the or a uh, lot of waste to put in a plastic uh, this thing and put on a, a walkway uh, so the that civic sense i think that is the starting point if everybody everyone believes that uh, it it should not be done like this or it should be done like this then things will become much more simpler so a major movement a, a freedom struggle type of movement has to uh, be started in creating that civic sense responsibility because every individual is the source of uh, waste creation so unless every individual tackles it uh, ag ag aggregately it cannot be handled and another last point which i want to add is uh, there are not enough business models for let us say ppp uh, mode private participation business models and i think the university uh, andhra university or institutions should come up with business models should come up with documentation for bidding those business models in a sustainable manner maybe it is not going to be economically viable for certain time but uh, a, a, a subsidy uh, covenant can be included the, the 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 softening of the whole thing by the government for certain years so that later on it will become self sustaining so i think viable business models have to be created so that more and more private entrepreneurs young entrepreneurs uh, can 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 come into this uh, picture and another last point which i want to add is how can we convert this uh, waste management waste handling into a blue collar job uh, now a person uh, uh, taking a broom and then cleaning uh, is is going to be very very difficult now let me let me if i have a uh, a minute let me share my example Uh, we bought a a robo for cleaning my new house which i moved in earlier i never used to bother what waste and all now since robo has come i have to clean it up and i have to start every day so involvement of technology infusion of technology can make it a blue collar job the the the, the negative uh, feeling perception that that goes with the waste management has to be removed and i think we have to come up with ways of Uh, making these jobs in fact is going to be a great job creator which is a requirement of the day in india especially with the youth dividend and uh, so much of youth population looking for the opportunities if we can convert them into respectable dignified blue collar jobs then i think uh, uh, the youngsters can can take on and then uh, change the whole thing so overall i i i would like to congratulate the andhra university for uh, for i think wonderful i think today is an engineers day i think very very apt uh, uh, session on this uh, thing and uh, congratulate uh, dr uh, prakasham for his nice uh, comprehensive uh, uh, enlightenment of uh, circular economy and how it can be applied into waste management thank you thank you all i can add one little comment uh, dr redigaru Uh, this is exactly the thing in a micro scale i'm trying to do in vishakhapatnam what you just said how to convert these low paying jobs into blue collar jobs and uh, 
with uh, my great tenacity, as you know, I, I don't quit easily. I worked with you, so you know me. <laughs> so without the involvement of the government, sorry, because it takes a lot of time, and I, I don't know how much time the good Lord has given me. But I, with using my own resources, if uh, the local uh, people can cooperate with me, I'm not asking anybody any money. And only thing is that money is already raised. If I can prove that to in, through India Youth for Society, where 25 people, uh, people can be employed. And I will show you how this can multiply. And uh, they will become entrepreneurs. If, if some angel investor there, I can make them overnight rich. I mean, that's like next five years, let's say. You know, that can be done because these people are so motivated. And if you give them money and make them respectable, that waste is, is something like that, we can do it. It motivates me I have to, have, I have to hold hands with them. They're not like, you know, wearing a suit and telling them what to do. So I, I've done that. I, I, I don't mind doing that. I will do it. I will continue to do it as long as I live. So this way I got results, uh, you know, as you know, with my limited capacity and not able to uh, visit India too often and things like that. But I, I feel very confident to do that. Even before Modi ji declared Swachh Bharat camp and I eliminated def open defecation in my little town, little community, my prayers were answered when he announced that Swachh Bharat, you know, some more things are moving. So I appreciate your comments, which are very legitimate. I, I, it is painful for me uh, to again get a validation of these things because that, that, there is a truth. And uh, uh, youngsters like Sri Devi and others should get off these chairs and then move, motivate the students and get to work and not celebrating, you know, these days with, with lunches and dinners, but clean up. Reverse Day is coming September 18th. Clean up the beach. Go and show the solidarity to India Youth for Society. I, I will watch you guys doing that. India Youth for Society, September 18th, next week. Right there. Will you promise me, Sri Devi, to do something on that day? Huh? I mean, I'm challenging you. I'm doing it up here on Fox River. On next time. I'm so please, please encourage your students. To come. They can have a party. Fantastic party they can have. They can play games on that day. And put on the media is very good in this kind of a thing. You can tell them, my kids are doing it. You can be feel proud of them. Do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, sir. We will definitely take your points into consideration. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sir. Just, just do it. <laughs> we don't want you to consider. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity. Again, the whole university staff, including Prasad Garu, Dr. Paul, and, King, and yourself. And, uh, Mina and all the organizers, you worked very hard. I bothered you a lot uh, by sending repeatedly some things like that. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Dr. Mina, thank you. Namaste. Namaskar. Namaskar. Namaste. And can I get up now? It's already 12.30 for me. For it's you, it is lunch time, maybe. <laughs> can I can I go? I, I, can you do you have a recording of the proceedings? I would like to have a recording. Yes, sir. No, not this one. I mean, the other speakers. I, I, I know my stuff. But yes, I respect them. I don't want to leave them um, because um, I love to hear what they say. These other professors. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. May I now request Sri P. Venkat Rao, sir, Joint Organizing Secretary, to introduce Dr. Pilon Agishwara Garu. Very good morning to all. This is P. Venkata Rao, working as assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering, Andhra University, Visakhapatnam. It's my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Nageshra Garupila. Dr. Nageshra Garupila is presently working as associate professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering, Engineers of Technology, Gauvati, India. Dr. Nageshra Garu did his Master of Technology and PhD in Chemical Engineering from in Institute of Technology, Kanpur, India. He was the postdoctoral researcher in chemical and biomolecular engineering in the year 2011 from the University of Delaware, New York, US. Dr. Nagesh Rao Garu is having 17 years of research experience in the field of chemical engineering and having lot of expertise in various areas like biomass to value-added chemicals and fuels. Renewable hydrogen production, reaction kinetics, and microkinetic modeling, and etc. 
As a part of research contribution, Dr. Nagesh Rogarupila has guided good number of postdocs and PhD scholars. And he has published 44 international journal articles and three book chapters. In addition to this, he has filed two Indian patents and apart from this, he has successfully completed several R&D projects. But Dr. Nagesh Rogarupila has organized 23 conferences and delivered 12 invited talks. He also received prestigious awards, honors, and achievements. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Now I request Dr. Pilan Nagaswaraga from IIT Gauhati to deliver his lecture on lignocellulosic biomass to specialty chemicals and fields. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, ma'am, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, so now I will share my slides. Yes. So ma'am, can you see my slides? No. Yes, sir. Yeah, now it's okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Can I start? Yes, sir, you can start. Thank you. Okay, so at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present uh, my research on the lignocellulosic biomass to specialty chemicals and fuels. Uh, okay, so if we uh, look at the petroleum, Okay, the petroleum resource that which is a fossil based resource. Uh, there is, uh, you know, like uh, there is a uh, depletion uh, uh, like now or later. So I, uh, here I have presented to a total of 12 scenarios uh, like uh, so here we can see the billion barrels per year production or uh, recovery uh, as a as a function of uh, uh, time so here like till uh, 2000 uh, to, till year 2000 it is the history and then uh, after after 2000 it like we have uh, there are 12 scenarios where like i mean three are uh, ultimate recovery the amount of ultimate recovery that we can get and uh, four are uh, based on the growth uh, of uh, demand for the for this uh, resource so uh, now uh, the ultimate recovery that we can get the expected recovery is about 3000 billion barrels and uh, and if there is uh, like 5% higher than the expected value then it will be around 3900 and if it is 5% 5, 5 less then it will be like 2,250 uh, billion barrels. Now, uh, if we uh, see the, like, I mean, growth rate in, in terms of growth rate, like if, if there is like 3% growth rate, then we see the peak uh, somewhere around uh, like 2,035 or so. And if it like, I mean, for the higher value and for the mean value, it is about 2,000, uh, 2030 or so. So now, um, like the the I mean the peak range varies uh, like from 2021 to 2000 uh, like 100. So in between these two, based on this scenario, based on this uh, uh, you call uh, like predictions, we we may get peak at any time. I mean peak in the sense the uh, the petroleum. Uh, recovery peak or the petroleum utilization peak can come uh, like anywhere between 2021 and 2112 okay so uh, like that that basically based on the uh, the ultimate recovery and the growth rate okay so if it is uh, let's say zero growth rate and with uh, like five percent higher than the expected uh, recovery then the peak uh, will come at 2112 year 2112 and if it is uh, if the growth rate is 3% uh, 
and uh, the expected uh, the the mean ultimate recovery is lower than 5% uh, the the expected value then it is it will, the the peak will come at 2021 okay so if 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 we add about 9 900 uh, billion barrels then we see the peak will be moved by 10 years okay so uh, so like uh, so this is the basically the uh, the, the prediction now if we see like where we stand okay like uh, where we stand at in uh, 2019 let's say so the the world oil production is uh, rate is like 35 billion barrels per year like in the year 2019 uh, we have produced about 35 billion barrels and that is standing uh, like if you look at here that is standing somewhere here. <clears throat> uh, just a minute, let me get the pointer. Yeah, so that is standing somewhere here, which basically tells us that um, like our the, the growth rate of demand is about two percent, uh, and and like we we may uh, reach the peak somewhere uh, in two thousand. Uh, like and I mean in the in the range of like 2030 uh, like around 2027 to 2045 or or slightly higher. <clears throat> okay, so basically I mean what dictates this uh, like I mean uh, this this peak uh, that I mean uh, like I mean the the ultimate uh, utilization of petroleum and uh, like what what this was what. Uh, factor that dictates the growth rate of this uh, demand that like if we look at that this this depends on two things majorly one is uh, new technologies with higher efficiency like if we uh, incorporate uh, newer technologies with higher efficiency like by utilizing the process intensification uh, like uh, prospects or if we have uh, like percentage of uh, if we add more alternative energy resources such as uh, like biomass resource or solar energy uh, or wind energy and so on like if we look at the global energy consumption statistics we can see here that uh, uh, from 1973 to 19 uh, 2018 uh, the the requirement or the energy consumption is doubled okay from from 6000 uh, like million tons oil equivalent to 14000 uh, million tons of oil equivalent so it is uh, slightly more than double of uh, what uh, we basically i mean uh, like the, the energy consumption globally and now if we look at the like fossil sources versus the renewable sources and other other uh, like other conventional sources we can see that the, the oil consumption like i mean the the percentage of oil consumption is de decreased i mean the if we look at the absolute number all the numbers are increased obviously but if we look at the like source resource wise then the oil consumption decreased and natural gas and uh, natural gas increased significantly and coal uh, increased slightly and if we look at the biofuels the the consumption of biofuels the uh, i mean in terms of percentage is nearly uh, similar to what it is in 1973 and if you look at the potential we have basically like 2400 million tons oil equivalent per year uh, potential for this, uh, uh, I mean, for, for the utilization of uh, biomass energy, but at present we are using only 10%, as you see in the uh, statistics. And this, uh, like this 2400, basically contributes about 20% of the glo global consumption. So, and also if we look at the, uh, uh, like, I mean, the, the, areas where this biomass energy is being used the, it is majorly used for the residential purposes okay for like heating purposes uh, is the major use for this biomass energy and remaining like people are using it for heat and power generation like you see 
in in uh, in in pepper and pulp in uh, uh, sugar industries. Okay, so people use this as a heat and power source. Okay. So now, if we look at the uh, like um, the energy consumption in India, the scenario in India, like we can see that uh, India imports more than two thousand four hundred, like two uh, sorry two hundred and forty million metric tons of crude oil and forty four million metric tons of uh, liquefied natural gas in two thousand nineteen. And if so, that is basically making a huge uh, import bill. Like that is giving us a huge import bill. You can see here, like the import bill in 2009 itself is about 90,000 million US dollars. Okay, so now it is now it increased significantly because if you look at uh, the 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 amount of oil that we imported is only 140 in 2009. And that increased to, to, to 240 million metric tons in the year 2019. So, see, so similarly, the import bill also increased. So, now if we look at the uh, amount of biomass available in India, that is like 500 million metric tons per year. That is, I'm just talking about the biomass that is surplus, that is being wasted. And out of this, only only half of it being used uh, in uh, in areas like um, in sugar industry and all but the remaining 250 million metric tons is being simply wasted or like landfilled or uh, it is just incinerated which is basically creating a lot of uh, air pollution as well as land pollution so now <clears throat> if we look at the scenario like what what we are doing with biomass Biomass is contributing to 20, like 20 percent of the energy consumption in India, and uh, like if we look at the bio oil yield from fast pyrolysis, is is up to 15 to 45 weight percentage. So even if we uh, do a simple calculation with we can contribute up to seven. of this biomass uh, we have in India. And then uh, if we look at what are the advantages that we have uh, for, for biomass utilization of biofuels, uh, these are renewable uh, feedstocks. So it basically reduce the life cycle of uh, greenhouse gas that is carbon dioxide. And uh, because that is that is because that the whatever uh, uh, like whatever carbon dioxide that we are producing by utilizing that in transportation or in some other application, that carbon dioxide is being used for the growth of the biomass. And by that way, we are closing this uh, cycle quickly as compared to the, the, the fossil fuels because the, the, for, the, for the production of fossil fuels, it takes about a million years. And we have used this entire uh, fossil fuel that is generated in about 150 years okay like we have started using it in uh, in the year about 2090 or in that range okay like sorry uh, sorry like 90s in, in 1900s uh, in that range and uh, now it is 2020 so in 120 years we have significantly significant amount of uh, fossil fuels uh, used Okay, so like we can reduce the other pollutants such as carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and uh, SOX. We, we can reduce the dependence on uh, foreign crude oil supplies. So now what are the disadvantages? So the, the disadvantages are uh, land usage. Basically, like whatever 500 million metric tons that I talked about, that is uh, surplus biomass for which we do not need to use any extra land. But once we started started making these uh, biofuels, we need to uh, like uh, we need to add some extra uh, biomass because of the transportation issues and all. 
so there may be some utilization of bio like land uh, in in terms of that and then uh, like once we start growing the biomass we need to use fertilizers pesticides uh, to have the uh, considerable growth uh, for the efficient uh, production of biomass and then uh, water usage there will be uh, competition between food and the uh, biomass or uh, the i mean biofuels for the this thing and then efficiency of the biomass conversion to energy like as i as i said it is about 15 to 45 percent but it needs to be increased to have a more efficient system so like these are some of these disadvantages are only when we utilize the extra biomass that is required but if we use the amount of surplus biomass that is available already in india then these so most of these disadvantages can be yeah. So, so now, uh, what are the constituents of biomass and its um, uh, chemical structure? The major constituents of biomass are uh, hemicellulose, lignin, and uh, cellulose microfibrils. So these uh, these three, like basically, this uh, cellulose are uh, uh, like sorry, hemicellulose is a is a heteropolymer of C5 sugars and uh, acetyls. And and this basically make bonds with uh, makes bonds with other uh, other parts of the biomass that is lignin and cellulose through this uh, uh, lignin carbohydrate complex and uh, some kind of hydro uh, hydrogen bonding. And uh, th this is the uh, cellulose, and this cell cellulose is a polymer of uh, glucose majorly. And it contains uh, they, they are the glucose molecules are bonded by beta glycosidic bonds, which are very strong. That is the reason why it is difficult to uh, break cellulose molecules as compared to starch and uh, other simpler uh, uh, polymers. Okay. And so here the lignin lignin is a complex polymer of uh, uh, of phenolic groups. And this is also bonded with uh, hemicellulose through this lignin uh, carbohydrate complex. So now, if we so uh, the the major challenge utilizing the only biomass, only lignocellulosic biomass as a feedstock to produce uh, uh, bio oil, is uh, the like lack of uh, hydrogen, like less amount of hydrogen present in the in the feedstock. Okay, uh, and uh, and uh, there is huge amount of oxygen present. Okay, so about fifty percent is the oxygen in the in the biomass. The biomass. So to to avoid uh, to avoid the issues that we uh, that, that we face uh, in terms of uh, obtaining the better fuel while like during the pyrolysis of lignocellulosic biomass we add the plastic okay, waste plastic into it so the waste plastic contains more hydrogen the hydrogen to carbon ratio is higher in in, uh, in plastic as compared to that in uh, in, in biomass in biomass so that like uh, here we can see like where there are uh, various biomass sorry various plastics uh, I think someone's mic is on so because of that there is some echo coming. Could you please uh, switch out uh, your mic? Okay, thank you. So, like these are various uh, biome, uh, in various uh, plastic that are being used in in uh, like uh, in our globe. So, major contribution is from polyethylene. So, there are various types of polyethylene. Uh, high density polyethylene, low density polyethylene, and polyethylene. near low density polyethylene. So that is contributing to 36 percent, and remaining like there are various other plastics also. Like what? Like basically, when we look at the waste plastic, as uh, like our uh, uh, I mean previous speaker already mentioned, uh, Dr. Prakashun Tata. So there is a there is an amount of 8.3 billion tons global production of plastic that is in 2016 I think 
and then so that is uh, that that is this is a cumulative amount okay by like 2016 or 17 in that year like we we uh, our globe produced 8.3 billion tons of uh, plastic that is uh, total amount of plastic produced from the beginning okay the entire amount of plastic and out of that 6.3 billion tons of plastic waste is generated and uh, that is also in total and out of that like 72 percent going to landfilling 14 percent incinerated and 14 percent recycled so the the recycling is good yes, uh, the remaining parts incineration incineration or uh, landfilling these are hazardous and uh, they 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 create uh, like toxic uh, elements in the toxic pollutants uh, in the in the nature and uh, so bo both these um, like both these processes uh, landfilling and incineration lead to contamination of soil water and air so, so that basically affects the human health so uh, so like instead of uh, landfilling if we use this plastic in uh, in 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 our uh, in, in our copyrolysis process then it basically helps in increasing the hydrogen to carbon ratio and that uh, in turn uh, improves the, uh, the 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 pyrolysis characteristics and the characteristics of the bio oil that we produce so uh, this is my overall block diagram that how I use uh, the biomass to produce chemicals and fuels. So I will briefly explain about this. Uh, uh, like first we take the raw biomass and we do the catalytic wet torrefaction that basically very selectively separates xylose uh, from the biomass. That is in like, I mean, hemicellulose will be separated in the form of xylose selectively uh, from the biomass and the remaining hydrochar is uh, generated and from this hydrochar we can produce uh, glucose and uh, fructose uh, from the cellulosic part of this hydrochar or we can utilize the hydrochar as it is for, for producing fuels by mixing it with uh, plastic that is what we are uh, doing and this xylose we can further convert into we are for, we, we further convert into furfural and after separations and this uh, furfural is further converted to levulinic acid formic acid uh, and uh, hydroxymethyl furfural and, and uh, uh, so can you see my slides i i could not see the slides just now it is gone so, sir uh, let me share again yeah okay uh, so so this is uh, like i mean uh, like from furfural we produce levulinic acid formic acid and 5 hydroxy methyl furfural and also like from the glucose that we produce from cellulose we produce uh, labelinic acid, formic acid, and 5-hydroxymethyl uh, furfural, as well as lactic acid. So these are the specialty chemicals that we generate from the raw biomass. And then the, the remaining hydrochar that is produced in bat torrefaction, we utilize for the production of uh, fuels by mixing it with uh, waste plastic. So that uh, so these are the uh, reaction pathways that we uh, utilized for the production of valuable chemicals. But like these are only some of the uh, like production pathways. Uh, I will try to explain. So it's the from uh, lignocellulosic biomass, we first separate the hemicellulose, and that will be that is converted to xylose, and then uh, xylose is converted to furfural. And, uh, and and uh, uh, from the same biomass, we uh, separate cellulose, and that cellulose is converted to glucose by using uh, acid catalyst, and uh, this glucose is converted to HMF, and also to labelinic acid. Okay, so so here uh, these, I mean, like we in our uh, uh, research, we have uh, developed a new process. 
for for converting the for furan directly into levirin ether so the actual the conventional route to convert uh, the furfural into levirinic acid is this uh, like via furfural uh, so furfural alcohol which requires metal catalyst metal catalyst but uh, and, and also high pressure hydrogen but without uh, help of those only in the in presence of acid catalyst we can convert uh, uh furfural into levirinic acid okay so this is a low temperature process as well as uh, a less costlier process so these are uh, the chemical production pathways but due to lack of time i am going to uh, restrict my talk to only uh, catalytic copyrolysis of hydrochar and plastic so we, so this is the process to develop the, to produce the hydrochar and this is the process to produce bio oil from hydrochar so we add uh, waste plastic to hydrochar and do the catalytic copyrolysis by using uh, catalysts like uh, geolites okay hy or hzsm5 and we produce the bio oil so this is the sample preparation so we take the low density sorry linear low density um, polyethylene beads and we convert them into powder by using the resolution followed by precipitation method and then we take the biomass from bamboo sawdust and we wash dry and grind sieve to to produce the required size of the biomass so this is the vector fraction uh, method that we uh, we have used in our uh, study so we uh, like we 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 take the biomass into water and we add catalyst formic acid and nacl and then sodium chloride and then we heat heat it at various temperatures 120 to 150 degrees centigrade and uh, for times 30 to 90 minutes and uh, uh, we take out the sample and we filter it and we do the hplc uh, uh, high pressure uh, liquid chromatography to analyze the products so the, uh, like after the the solid product that we obtain is the uh, hydrochar so that that we use and that is also like torrified bamboo sawdust that that we uh, call it as torrified uh, bamboo sawdust okay this is nothing but uh, hydrochar so i utilize these terms interchangeably so uh, these are the concentrations of uh, like various mixtures and uh, in in uh, uh, catalytic copyrolysis we have used 150 milligrams of catalyst uh, for, for, for 100 milligrams of sample okay so this is these are uh, some results with uh, vector refraction the hemicellulose separation mm -hmm. and cellulose so here we can see uh, like this is the uh, uh, this is the yield formula that we use. Okay, there may be that confusion that uh, why, uh, like, even though the hemicellulose amount is about 30 percent in the whole biomass, why we are getting yield of 85 percent? So the reason is that we are we are in the yield calculation. We are considering only the initial moles of hemicellulose present. Okay, and uh, the hemicellulose is calculated based on the uh, basic equivalent uh, xylose with a molecular weight of 132 uh, gram per mole so so here this is the these are the pentose yields and the pentose yields are increasing with temperature up to 140 and then uh, decreased and uh, and with time the pentose uh, yields are slightly decreasing and so uh, the, so, so the overall uh, conditions that uh, we can utilize are 140 and 30 minutes, where we are getting the highest yield of uh, xylose from uh, biomass. And then, uh, then like if we increase the temperature to higher levels, then there is a formation of furfural, which is basically the second step that I showed in the reaction pathways. This is the next step of uh, converting hemi hemi cellulose to xylose uh, so, okay so xylose will be further con if we use higher temperatures the cell the xylose will be further converted to furfural 
Okay, so uh, we have seen the effect of uh, sodium chloride concentration as well as uh, formic acid concentration. So now, so we can see here the approximate and ultimate analysis. So here we can clearly see the the oxygen amount reduced. Okay, after torrefaction, oxygen amount is reduced, and hydrogen amount and carbon amount are increased. Okay, so uh, but the the hydrogen to carbon ratio is slightly lower than the original BST, the raw BST. That is because the carbon amount also increased significantly. But if you look at the oxygen to carbon ratio, that is uh, decreased significantly, which is a, uh, like I mean, good thing. And then we have uh, we have this LLDP. Okay, the uh, linear low density polyethylene whose uh, uh, hydrogen to carbon ratio is very high as compared to the the biomasses that we use. Therefore, if we utilize uh, um, this this plastic in our pyrolysis process, then that will be helpful in uh, intensifying the process as well as to improve the characteristics of the pyrolysis oil. So, so this is basically the surface characterization of BSD and TBSD. We can see uh, the, the crystallinity of the cellulose slightly improved. That is because of the removal of hemicellulose. Okay, and here in the FESCM figure, we can clearly see that there is a removal of uh, hemicellulose from the okay from the uh, from the biomass okay so like we can we can clearly see the bundle structure of uh, cellulose okay so th that the random structure that is coming from the uh, hemicellulose is removed okay uh, after uh, wet torrefaction so this this is uh, like uh, i mean based on the functional group study we can say that uh, the, the lignin carbohydrate complex is broken after uh, torrefaction that basically helps in uh, that that basically uh, helps in improving the pyrolysis characteristics as well as uh, we, we see here uh, the removal of hemicellulose and this is uh, some reaction mechanism okay for wet torrefaction so here, uh, like uh, like majorly, the hemicellulose part is uh, is is degraded uh, completely, and the re the reason for that is the the formic acid that we are using is uh, is converted to hydronium ion uh, by reacting with water, and that hydronium ion, which acts as a Bronsted acid uh, acid site, that uh, that uh, breaks the acetyl groups from the uh, xylan uh, polymer as well as uh, the the form of, uh, the uh, what you call um, uh, the glycosidic bonds in the xylan okay xylan units uh, the 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 breaking of uh, uh, this uh, uh, what you call um, glycosidic bonds Will result in xylose, results in xylose, and uh, the breaking of this uh, carbon oxygen bond results in either acetic acid formation or formic acid formation. So, here this basically gives the uh, uh, like xylopyranose conversion, that is xylose conversion to furfural, so which is happening at the higher uh, temperatures. <clears throat> Okay, so now uh, coming to the pyrolysis, okay, uh, like pyrolysis of uh, uh, BSD, TBSD, and and co-pyrolysis of BSD with uh, um, with uh, with plastic. Sorry, this is uh, this heading is only pyrolysis, not co-pyrolysis here. Uh, so, <clears throat> the, like here we can see the. Uh, the, the thermogravimetric uh, analysis plot uh, on the top and uh, at in, in the bottom we can see the differential thermogravimetric uh, plot okay 
So here, uh, and also we can see the deconvoluted uh, uh, curves of this D2Z plot. So, uh, so here the VSD is having four peaks. Okay, like the first peak that is lower at, uh, at lower than 100 degrees centigrade is from moisture, and uh, here if we see that in TBSD that is reduced because of the hydrophobicity of the TBSD uh, that we uh, that we produce. Okay, and uh, and the second peak is from the hemicellulose. Okay, that is present in the BSD that is bamboo sawdust. Okay, we, here BSD is bamboo sawdust, TBSD is horrified uh, bamboo sawdust. So the second peak here is from hemicellulose and third peak is from cellulose and the fourth peak that is obtained at around 400 degrees centigrade is from lignin. Okay, uh, decomposition of lignin. So now if we compare these three peaks with uh, uh, TBS that are coming from the TBSD, we can clearly see that the hemicellulose peak is disappeared. Okay, so that means the hemicellulose that is present is completely uh, removed during the torrefaction process. And the peaks from cellulose and hemicellulose are slightly, uh, sorry, cellulose and uh, lignin are slightly enhanced. And we can also see that the the uh, the lignin peak is more uh, like more sharper as compared to lignin peak in BSD. That is because uh, the the formation of weaker bonds uh, of lignin during the uh, torref torrefaction process. Okay. So now coming to the uh, uh, the catalytic copyrolysis of. Uh, uh, of biomass and waste of uh, like LLDP plastic over geolite HY. So we can see that. So, so this is the TGF. These are the TGF plots at five degrees centigrade per minute. These are the. So this, these are these are at twenty. Uh, okay, so there is an again, uh, there is some noise coming from the. Okay. So, okay. Like here, if we look at the DTG plots, we can clearly see that as we increase the, uh, like as we increase the ramp rate, the that uh, the peak temperature is increasing slightly. So here it is about 350, it is about 380, and this is close to 400 degrees centigrade at 40 degrees centigrade per minute. So uh, this basically tells us that when when you like when we increase the ramp rate, the the mass and heat transfer effects are coming into picture. Okay, so uh, so like I have deconvoluted these these plots, okay, these DTG plots to get more insights uh, at at 10 degrees centigrade per minute. All these plots are for 10 degrees centigrade per minute, and uh, this is uh, TBSD, that is uh, torrefied bamboo sawdust, and this is TBP one is to three, which which means that uh, like torrefied biomass plus plastic at the weight ratio of one to three, okay. One one torrefied biomass and uh, three times uh, plastic. Okay, so this is pure plastic. So here, what we can see is that uh, we have uh, uh, the the biomass and the the sorry the cellulose peak and the lignin peak. So there is no hemicellulose peak here. And then when we use uh, a blend of torrefied biomass and plastic, we have uh, like uh, three peaks, one extra peak that is coming from the LLDP. So that peak is coming at around 250 degrees centigrade. And the remaining two peaks correspond to uh, TBST, okay? That is cellulose and lignin. And the third peak is also 
uh, like some part of um, LNDP. Okay. So now if we compare the DTZ plots, uh, like with HY and uh, without, without any catalyst, we can clearly see that when we utilize this for uh, um, um, okay, let's say uh, where is it? Sorry, I think this this is this is for uh, TBSD. This is not TB uh, TBL three is to one. This is TBSD. So so the, here uh, we can see that with with the catalyst the the reaction temperature is increasing as compared to. Uh, that without without catalyst. That is basically uh, like what it basically says is that uh, the, the pyrolysis of TBSD uh, in presence of catalyst is not useful. Okay, like use of catalyst for the pyrolysis of TBSD is not useful. Uh, but if we if we use uh, catalyst, for example, for LLDP, then we can see that the um, uh, like the, the the pyrolysis temperature is significantly decreased okay like the uh, the pyrolysis temperature in the case of without catalyst is for uh, 80 degrees centigrade and uh, like in presence of catalyst it is, it is coming out to be 253 degrees centigrade and there is a there is a kind of uh, hump here uh, like there is a lag in the uh, decomposition of uh, uh, LLDP in presence of catalyst. And if we compare the two catalysts, HY and uh, HZSM5, so we can, here we can see that uh, the HY is better in terms of pyrolysis of uh, TBSD as compared to HY because the pyrolysis temperature is lower for uh, HZSM5 as compared to uh, that for uh, uh, HY. Okay, and for for LLDP, the the trend is slightly reverse. Here you can see the LLD, the the pyrolysis temperature is lower in case of HY as compared to that in case of HZSM five. And and one more observation here is that uh, like in in presence of HZSM five, we are seeing only a single peak even for the blanks. Okay, we are seeing only single peak for the blends, uh, so which is which is basically a better characteristic for pyrolysis as compared to multiple peaks. Uh, that is uh, because uh, we can utilize a single temperature for the uh, for the pyrolysis process uh, and lower temperatures. So now to look at the synergistic effects, uh, we have uh, like I mean uh, like we we need to. Uh, uh, what you call uh, like we need to calculate the weight of the uh, individual compounds at any at any particular time or at any, at any particular temperature in the in the TGA process and uh, delta W can is calculated from the weight of experimental which is basically the weight of the blend minus the uh, like the the weight equivalent of the individual fractions okay so the, the xa is the, uh, the weight fraction of the material okay of each material i here the uh, either tbsd or lldp okay so now if we look at the synergistic effects that are coming from uh, only copyrolysis and catalytic copyrolysis we can very clearly see that at lower temperatures there is a passive uh, synergism for the catalytic copyrolysis, okay, sorry, for, for the copyrolysis process, which is because uh, like and, and then at higher temperatures, there is a uh, that there is a positive synergistic effect, which is uh, basically uh, which increases the uh, like I mean which is having uh, more weight loss as compared to individual compounds okay that is what this uh, uh, synergism mean so like the the reason behind this is that like when we have this mixture of lldp and bsd the first uh, at lower temperatures the lldp 
melts and it forms a layer something like this and this layer basically hinders the pyrolysis of biomass and that uh, basically uh, ultimately at higher temperatures breaks and forms uh, uh, and, and forms the pyrolysis products that way uh, here like we, we see a high synergism at higher temperatures. Okay, so but in the case of catalyst, when, when we utilize a catalyst, the there is some kind of opposite trend we see. At lower temperatures, we see uh, some positive synergism, but at higher temperatures, there is a uh, like uh, like uh, and passive synergism, and that is that is because of the like presence of catalyst, we could not see the uh, this kind of uh, like passivation layer forming. Uh, during the pyrolysis process, as we observed in case of uh, only co pyrolysis process. Okay, so now let us look at the kinetics. Um, so, like we have taken this as uh, a single reaction biomass giving volatiles, gas, and char. So, the like we can see the uh, kinetic equation as d alpha by dt, kt, f of alpha. And like I, uh, I'm uh, giving the final expression because of the lack of time. So here, so so this is the final expression that we get. G of alpha is equal to A by beta, uh, T naught to exp of minus E alpha by RT dt. Uh, that is uh, basically uh, an, an equation for which we can we cannot have the analytical solution. So we need approximations. And this is the general uh, equation that we get for some approximations. And uh, like if we take uh, B is equal to 2 and C is equal to 1 from the Dole's approximation, then we get uh, this kind of expression which we can utilize. This is called the Kissinger Akihara Suno's model. And this we utilize for the, uh, for the prediction of uh, activation energy for these processes. And this is what we see uh, for the co pyrolysis activation energy as a function of conversion. So here we can see the black dots are the uh, activation energies as a function of uh, conversion for the TBSD, and the red dots, uh, red circles, uh, are the <clears throat> uh, activation energies for BSD, okay, uh, bamboo sawdust. And we can see here when at lower temperatures, the activation energy is nearly constant and then it increases slowly at higher conversions. That is because of the char formation, which uh, breaks down very slowly. Okay, so because of that, we have uh, we need higher activation energy to break the char molecules or the high high molecular weight uh, molecules. Okay. And if we look at the LLDP, it, it follows a opposite trend. Uh, that is, at lower temperatures, the activation energy increases, and then uh, at higher temperatures, it uh, it it uh, uh, like kind of uh, constant. And uh, if we look at the blends, uh, like TBP three is to one, TBP one is to one, TBP one is to three. We see that at higher uh, uh, at higher biomass content or at higher hydrochar content, the the trend of activation energy is uh, is similar to that of uh, TBSP, and uh, at high at higher uh, loading of uh, plastic, the trend is similar to that of uh, that of plastic. Okay. So now if we compare the activation energies in presence of any catalyst, like let's say in presence of JSM5, we can see that there is a, uh, the first thing that we can observe is uh, a significant decrease in the activation energy as compared to the uh, without catalyst case. Okay, so but, but the trends, if we look at the trends are more or less similar. But one another observation that we can make here is that is that uh, the the okay the activation energy 
of TBSD is higher as compared to that of LLDP. Okay. So here um, uh, we have this um, like TBSD here, and uh, the activation energy of TBSD is lowest in the case of uh, copyrolysis. And the, the activation energy of TBSD is the highest in case of in, in presence of catalyst. Okay, and uh, that is opposite with uh, LLDP. The, uh, the LLDP activation energy is lowest as compared to other uh, other, other uh, feedstocks. Okay, so like we can observe similar uh, trends in terms of uh, temperature requirement as a function of uh, conversion. So the, the temperature uh, increases with increase of conversion, that is obvious. And uh, like here also we can see that TBSD is having the lowest uh, temperature requirement and LLDP is having the highest temperature requirement. But here we see in case of, uh, in presence of catalyst, we see oh, opposite trend. Okay. Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> So, so that is uh, that. Uh, uh, so that is how it is. And then we have the uh, like HY also. We have the similar trends. And then these are some comparisons. Okay, um, uh, like activation energy in presence of uh, in presence and the absence of catalyst and with BSD and TBSD. So here we can see like TBSD and BSD. If we compare uh, various blends and the various individual compounds, we can see that the, the BSD is having higher uh, activation energy as compared to TBSD in all the cases, uh, except uh, like in when, when the uh, plastic content is higher, <clears throat> okay? But in, uh, in most of the cases, uh, except uh, uh, like pure DBS, TBSD, uh, in presence of catalyst, we have the lower activation energy uh, in all the cases. And uh, like if we compare uh, the three catalysts, we see that the, the I mean, two catalysts and without catalyst, we see that uh, in most of the cases, uh, even like including the TBP one is to three, we see HY is giving the lowest activation energy. Uh, so which is basically, uh, uh, I mean, so uh, based on the activation energy, HY is the preferred catalyst. But I mean, but I mean, uh, as as I have shown in the earlier comparisons, uh, HZSM5 is giving the single, uh, give, uh, like I mean, pyrolyzing the entire feedstock at a single temperature. And in terms of that, HZSM5 is better. Okay. And also, basically, we need to look at the actual products uh, which which is ongoing work in our uh, laboratory uh, to 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 make this comparison more fair. Okay. So these these are some reaction pathways of the blends. So cellulose and lignin uh, are uh, uh, are are broken into smaller uh, hydrocarbons. Okay, by like retroaldol condensation reactions, and uh, this also like I mean by three ways of linkages such as beta gamma uh, alpha O four linkages by using the retroaldol reaction. Okay, so these compounds form an hydrocarbon pool, and this uh, LLDP by beta session on uh, HZSM five. And, and mid chain session uh, forms uh, smaller smaller uh, olefin molecules and uh, hydrogen uh, radicals okay uh, so which basically result in the hydrocarbon pool inside the core of the zeolite that basically uh, results in formation of mono aromatic uh, hydrocarbons by diel solder reaction so this is uh, uh, so with this i would like to conclude my uh, my talk by saying that the hemicellulose part is selectively removed by using the catalytic wet torrefaction and the hydro char is having better pyrolysis characteristics as compared to raw biomass yes. uh, and also in terms of oxygen to carbon ratio 
it is lower in the case of uh, TBSD. Uh, the, the copyrolysis of hydrochar and LLDP show synergistic effects. Okay, the, the CCP, the catalytic copyrolysis process, reduced both activation energy as well as the temperature requirement as compared to those of the copyrolysis process. And then uh, the HYG led showed the lower activation energy as compared to HZS impact. But as I said, this should be taken uh, with care. We need to we need to see the product distribution. For example, uh, with uh, HZS M5, if we get more aromatic uh, content as compared to HY zeolite, then we obviously choose HY HZS M5 zeolite uh, over uh, HY zeolite for our. Uh, uh, like pyrolysis process. Okay, with that, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee. Uh, and before that, this is the student, uh, Mr. Uh, Alam, who has uh, done most of this work that I presented today. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank all the organizing committee and uh, my research sponsors, the uh, DST, the CRB, and Chemdist. Chemdist is uh, a Pune based company which is sponsoring some of these uh, technologies to uh, develop to commercial level. With that, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. So I take any questions if there are. Any queries from the participants? Thank you, sir. Uh, you have given as a clear image of the energy consumption in India and how much energy is being wasted by improper use of biomass, the harmful effects of plastic waste ought to be noted. We have understood how proper usage of biomass can be highly beneficial to the economy. The process of wet torrefaction was also very impressive, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> yeah. So ours is also Vishak Patnam. Maybe I will make a trip to Andhra University when I come to Vishak. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So now uh, we'll leave uh, we we'll leave for the lunch break and we'll connect at 2 30 p.m. Thank you.